I've been covering the prison at Guantanamo Bay throughout the Obama years. President Obama rushing to empty Guantanamo Bay just days before leaving office. I returned just before Obama left office as he and Donald Trump fought over the future of this place and the men detained here. He's allowing people to get out that are terrible people. Make no mistake, we will close Guantanamo prison. Get my way, keeping that open, and we're going to load it up with bad dudes. Gitmo still houses notorious terrorists like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the self-proclaimed mastermind of the 9-11 attacks. Tell us where we are. We're standing right now in front of Camp 6, and that's where the majority of the general population detainees are housed. Just don't get any guard faces in the, in the back. This time, I was here to report on Obama's final push to empty out the prison. In his last year, he released 52 detainees. Nearly half of them had been held without charges and were once considered too dangerous to let go. But military and intelligence officials finally deemed the men safe to set free. I wanted to know more about these decisions and what happened to the detainees once they got out. This gate would literally be the last gate that they walk through before they get on their transportation to leave Guantanamo Bay. just released to the United Arab Emirates. The detainees have been scattered around the globe, taken in under secret deals. Bodyguard for Osama bin Laden is now free after being held for 14 years. None of the officials involved in these deals will discuss the details, but most of the detainees were sent to Arab countries. The Obama administration quietly took 10 terror suspects from the prison at Guantanamo Bay and transferred them to the Middle Eastern country of Oman. Some were sent to rehab centers in places like Oman. The U.S. released four Yemeni men with some relatives waiting. Others were reunited with their families in Saudi Arabia. Every transfer was reviewed and approved by the Department of Defense. Hello. Hey, how are you? Chuck Hagel personally signed off on more than 40 detainees during his years as Secretary of Defense. In terms of the facts about former detainees, what did Americans make of their danger, their status? There's always the danger, of course, because this is an imperfect process. But every one of those detainees I signed off on, it was based on the best, absolute best information, intelligence, and knowledge and certification that we could, what we could come up with. And one of the final questions that I had to certify was, uh, in your opinion, uh, have you done everything to minimize the possibility that a detainee uh, would ever again do any harm to an American or any of our allies? What did that mean in, in practice, in, in figuring that out? I always took the approach that I wanted to be damn sure. And I wanted assurance from my security people that in fact they had seen physically where these people were going to be, who was going to monitor them, how often the monitoring. And on the other side, we say to the host countries that are going to accept them, we want these people to get back into society where they are productive citizens. That means education. That means rehabilitation. Of course, I mean, that's clearly in our interest. It's in the interest of the detainee. Few of the ex-detainees have been heard from since their release. Their lawyers say that the ones sent to Arab countries seem to be adjusting, but I've heard others are having problems. A handful of men who were taken to non-Arab countries with little support. One of them, among the last to leave Gitmo, is willing to talk. Mansour al daifi prisoner number 441 from Yemen. He was never charged, but for most of his 14 years at Gitmo, he was considered too dangerous to release. In 2015, a review board convened by President Obama determined he was no longer a threat. Yemeni detainees are barred from going home because of political instability there. So last summer, he and another detainee were transferred to Serbia.
Mansour's pro bono lawyer in New York says he's unhappy in Serbia and wants to live in an Arab country. Was he given any choice in where he was going to go? No, not really. It was pretty much presented as Guantanamo or Serbia. And what kind of rehabilitation has been provided for him in Serbia so far? From Serbia, as far as I can tell, nothing. And nothing from the U.S. government. If we are going to take someone after holding them for 14 or 15 years and not let them go home, and not let them go to the country they want to go to, not let them go to a place where they feel they themselves will be able to build a life, but force them to another place, then I think we have a responsibility to help them adjust to that and make it work. She says Mansour has gone on a hunger strike, protesting his situation. You have represented other Guantanamo detainees. In terms of Mansour's resettlement and reintegrating, is, is, is Mansour a unique case? I do not think he's the only one who's had a difficult time. I think a lot of the other men who have been sent to, say, Eastern Europe, which is a very unfamiliar culture for them and unfamiliar languages, have had a very hard time adjusting. People who were sent to countries like Oman, which are very familiar to them, which are a familiar language, which does have a formal rehabilitation program to help them make that adjustment. Those people seem to be doing pretty well. And if we want to make sure that these people are never going to be a threat to the U.S., um, the best way to do that is to make sure that they have a life that they are happy with. That's not going to happen if you put them someplace where they are totally isolated and they don't see any prospect for a future. As I set off to meet Mansour in Belgrade, Serbia, here's what I knew about him. He'd spent time at an al-Qaeda training camp in Afghanistan before being captured when he was in his early 20s. Much of his case file remains classified, but leaked documents show that at first, the U.S. government claimed he was an al-Qaeda commander. His final review, however, came to a very different conclusion. At worst, it says he was a low-level fighter, possibly not even a member of al-Qaeda at all. Mansour was known to exaggerate and change his story. In 2006, he claimed he was a committed jihadi and praised the 9-11 attacks. But by 2015, he claimed he wanted a college education and was a fan of Taylor Swift. Still, Serbia seemed a surprising place to send a man once labeled a Muslim terrorist. Every Muslim house burned, every Muslim killed or run off. In the 1990s, Serbian troops slaughtered tens of thousands of Muslim men, women, and children. The Serbs call it ethnic cleansing and brag about their efficiency. NATO bombed Belgrade to stop years of carnage. When the detainees arrived here last July, it made headlines. Some questioned if they were dangerous. The Serbian prime minister insisted they weren't. The other detainee has refused to talk at all, and Mansour has kept a low profile, avoiding publicity while his lawyer has been telling officials about his unhappiness and his hunger strike. Now he wants to go public in hopes of being moved. The Serbian government agreed to keep Mansour for two years. He can't leave the country. They give him a small stipend and an apartment. That's where we found him. Hey. Hello, sir. Okay. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. How are you feeling right now? I feel I'm lost, honestly, because I'm nowhere. I end up in Guantanamo 20 years old. I am still 20. In my mentally, I'm 20 years old. The way I'm thinking, the way I'm talking. But physically, I am 36. Because when you stay in jail, I mean, your mind and your intellectual, everything is still this, at the same. And the worst thing in Guantanamo, like what I have experienced, you don't know, I didn't know why, why I was there. And for how long are going to punish me? Until when? What's my, what's my crime? I wish if I had done something wrong, then yeah, I deserve that. But nothing. It's just capable, indefinite for no reason. It's not right at all. Mansour's detention may have been prolonged by what he told a review board in 2006. 
After nearly five years at Gitmo, he declared himself an enemy of the United States. I regret that now. I was mad. I was young. I was crazy. Of course. Imagine you are in a place where you are like all totally disconnected to the world outside, to your family, to lawyers, to anyone. They were extracting the worst of us to see the world. This is bad people. Mansour learned English at Gitmo, mostly from the guards, he says. And he wanted to study at an English language university here, but was rejected. He says it's because of his background, but the university told me he failed his entrance exam. He rarely leaves the house, especially now that he's on a hunger strike. My way is like uh, slowing down very, very fast. I started on uh, 154 pounds. Now I am on uh, 136, like almost 18 pounds. I have lost in 23 days. For most of the detainees at Gitmo, refusing to eat was a common form of protest. Mansour says he did it many times, and at one point was force-fed over the course of two years. Now he's using the tactic to pressure the U.S. to get him out of Serbia. What I am asking to be sent to other country, which I can start my life. That's what I want, to start a family, start to finish my education, and to live any like a normal person. That's what I want in my life, not more. Simple dream. What did you think when you heard Serbia? I was afraid, scared, afraid, to be honest with you, because the historical conflict between Serbian and Muslims in the 90s, this is like, God, I'm going to that country. You threw me in a country which I knew nothing about, no language. I mean, it's total chaos. The Serbian government told me that after two years, you are, you are leaving. And who is going to accept ex Guantanamo detain after what had, had been said about us? Every night, Mansour works on a memoir about his time at Guantanamo. He shared a draft with me. When we left him, we planned to come back the next morning and continue our interview. Within a few minutes, our taxi was pulled over. Police pull us over, about, I think, three or four officers. They said random check. We were with our local producer, Valerie Hopkins. We're talking now, he wants to know what do you guys do? We're reporters. Has ever happened to you before? Yeah. There is this, the next morning, before heading to Mansour's, he sent a text to frontline producer, James Jacoby. He says, look, I have a problem. And uh, he said, I, I, I don't think I can talk to you today. Government was here. That is what I can say now. Um, for now, I don't want to run into any problem, please. It's different now. No, please don't come. It will be a problem for me. Mansour went silent, and so began an unexpected journey. We went to his apartment and called him repeatedly. Customer you have dialed is unavailable at the moment. We spoke to his lawyer in New York, but she didn't know where he was either. In his texts, Mansour said the government had come, but he didn't say who or why. All we knew was that he had a Serbian government minder, but we didn't know where to find him. So we sought help from a local investigative journalist who's been pursuing the government for information about Mansour. This is a letter to a government in August, September also, November. So basically I am addressing to any possible authorities that are maybe in charge for, for this issue. 
and the government didn't even reply to, to my constant calls or mails. What have you been able to find out about the transfers? We found out that uh, government didn't uh, call any experts for uh, resocialization and trauma healing of those people. We found out that they didn't contact uh, Islamic communities in Serbia and notify them. And for sure, their help is needed in their resocialization. So basically, the only person who has everything on this case is the Prime Minister, who is not very keen of journalists. I found out the Prime Minister, Alexander Vucic, was having a press conference. When I arrived, I was referred to his interior minister, who's in charge of domestic security. Hello, nice to meet you. Likewise. Do you think we could talk to you uh, for a few minutes? What are the issues that you want? We're doing stories about the, uh, the Guantanamo detainees that have ended up in other countries. Give me a minute to think about it. Okay. I want to rethink whether I should say anything, because there are technical issues that are sensitive. I wanted to find out what he knew about Mansour's whereabouts. We've been interviewing one of the former detainees, and he suddenly went quiet on us. Is there any way that we could find out through through you, or is... Well, that they are now uh, private citizens as anyone else, and they have right to talk or not to talk with anyone, so we cannot force them to do that or influence them to do that. He's fallen out of contact with everybody, I and mean, we were actually concerned about what was going on with him. Well. I have no information that any one of them complained. We have a regular communication with them. And I think that they're very happy with the ongoing situation. And I would say that we are doing a very good job. We are trying to accommodate U.S. in a way of de-radicalizing these kind of individuals while closing Guantanamo. For two days, we looked all over Belgrade for Mansour. And the U.S. Embassy couldn't offer much help. Is the State Department responsible for these guys' well-being here? You know, I don't know. Um, you don't know? Well, the best answer is I don't know who has primary responsibility. While waiting on word from Mansour one night, I went into downtown Belgrade, where more than a thousand refugees from predominantly Muslim countries had set up a makeshift camp. The Serbian government has been trying to provide relief, but it's hard to keep up. You're from Afghanistan? Yeah, I'm from Afghanistan. And how long have you been here now? More than two months. What's it like living here? There behind the bus station. It's yeah. really cool there. It's not blanket, not pools, it's not water, no shower, nothing. New people come here, many people, a lot of children, families, and single men. It's not easy. When I was in Afghanistan, people call us, hey, you are not good Muslim. They tried to kill me. When we come to the Europe, you are say you are terrorist, but no reason why we terrorists. We did nothing bad here. And we run, we just run from terrorists. What we have to do, we really don't know. It's really hard, yeah. That night, we finally heard from Mansour. He was at the one place we didn't expect, our hotel. He told us that the morning we were supposed to continue our interview, several Serbian men barged into his apartment and told him to stop talking to us. They were serious, very serious. And they tried to push the door, they pushed the door, and one of them like uh, pushed me, I pushed them back. And I couldn't resist because I'm a tight. They took me to the ground. <laughs> really, I felt humiliated. I hit my head on the wall here. They went, I think, they were more than three. They checked the apartment, they took my phone. And they told me, basically, just, if you want to stay here, you have to 
keep your mouth shut, you are lying, you are playing games. If you can stay in this place, we're going to take you to some place where you don't like. That's it. Considering his past, it wasn't surprising the Serbians would keep tabs on him. And it was hard to tell how badly he was being treated. We pointed out that at Gitmo, he was known to exaggerate. I swear by my God, I, I didn't need to, to make it up. I understand. If you, if you judge me by this, sorry, I have to go. In Guantanamo, when they put you under pressure, under very bad circumstances, like 72 hours under very cold air condition and you were tied to the ground and someone came and poured cold water, whatever, tell him what he wants. Just, okay, get out of my skin. Why I should even lie about serving? I'm living here. Why should I create problems for myself with Serbian government? It was late, and Mansour wanted to talk to his lawyer in New York about staying overnight at the hotel. Honestly, last night I couldn't sleep. I have night nightmares all night. Even today, like, uh, I put a lot of stuff behind the door. And uh, I think I'm, go I'm going to keep doing this all the time. Okay, I will stay here tonight. Let me talk to her about that. Okay, James wants to talk to you. Beth, let me take your credit card number, unless you want to call the hotel directly and, and book the room for Mansoor. They have nowhere to go to. Like, I have to thought about it, to hide among the refugees, but uh, it's not a good idea. What name uh, do you want to use, Mansoor, for tonight? So I use 441. Tell her. She wants to use 441. <laughs> <laughs> The next day, we went to see if any of Mansour's neighbors had heard a disturbance. I was with Valerie, our local producer. <laughs> no one had heard a thing. But one neighbor said he thought the secret police were renting Mansour's apartment. Back inside, Mansour said he was worried the Serbs would return. I'm very afraid of these people. I'm afraid if they see your guys coming back, and back, they look at as a challenge. Do you think, Mansour, that there, there was a misunderstanding about the, the terms of, of, of your release, that this is more of the way that things are? I think you that, have certain restrictions that, that, are, that are placed upon well, you that, that they were not... When I was in Guantanamo, they haven't told me nothing about Serbia. They told me it would be good there. So, you know what? I'm, I will try to forget Guantanamo, start education, learning English, studying, blah, blah, blah. It's both. I try to be reasonable. I try to be nice. I'm trying to be quiet. Because if I get angry, I, I'm crazy. You know what's been crazy? Guantanamo teach us how to be crazy, crazy, crazy. I'm not making threats here, but this is how they push me to the corner. I'm trying to get my message to the Serbian uh, embassy about oh, US government about my problems here. But who cares? I mean, we just piece of there, just die. What, what matters? Later that day, we called the interior minister's office for comment about Mansour's situation. Hi, Nemanja. I reached his assistant. We've been interviewing one of the former detainees here, and he's made some allegations regarding how things are in, in Serbia and, and his treatment. It doesn't scan with, with what we've heard in the interview and what we heard at the press conference on, on Sunday. So it was some things we really needed to give, wanted to give the minister a, a chance to, to respond to. Okay. What about the We've had some interactions, I, I guess, with some, um, some people from the government that, that apparently... Um, didn't go pleasantly. Okay. Okay. Nemanja, thanks very much. We kept trying, but the government never would agree to an interview or respond to questions about Mansour and his allegations. The next day, our last in Serbia, I reread Mansour's memoir. The first line says, if you have a problem in the camps and you want your problem to be solved, 
he must cause another problem or many problems. The idea of the book, to let the reader live the life of the details. During our time here, Mansour would say very little about his past. But before leaving, I pressed him again about it and what he'd written about how Gitmo changed him. I have in my head, I think, the first line of, of your book, uh, which I won't get it precisely word for word. In the camps, if you have a problem uh, and you want to solve it, if you have a problem, you have to create other problems. You have to protest. You have to start behave crazy. You have to kick the doors. Why people behave like that? They're crazy. They're not crazy. This is the way how people behave. This is the way how, how actually the place make these people behave. I mean, we like animals in cages, literally. Just animals who can behave like humans. That way they were treated. I mean, I was wondering always what they want, what they want from us. How did you first get picked up by the Americans? Okay, we didn't want to go there first. I was sold like you than anyone else. You were sold? Sold by Afghans to, uh, to CIA. And from there, I was stuck here. I didn't want to mention Afghanistan. You don't want to talk about well, he wouldn't say more. According to his case file, Mansour was turned over to the U.S. by an Afghan warlord who was reported to be on the CIA payroll. As I told you, why don't you want to talk about that? Okay, let us say wrong time, wrong place. I need to write it and put it in my past in my separate book and separate story. You will see it one day, I promise you. You write about Guantanamo had the difficulty of being in a place where you don't trust anybody and no one trusts you. And you talk about the situation here in Serbia where there are people who, you know, say that you're a liar or, or like say that you're you know, might be making things up. I mean, first of all, the governments here, or every government, they get a, big, a picture from the United States government that the stereotype, those people are liars. They pretend they are psychologically ill, blah, blah, blah. And I was shocked and surprised. And everyone repeat the same thing. And I, I'm afraid that you all get affected with the, with the disease here, liar, liar, liar. I didn't want to talk to you more to appear a liar, a liar here. Finish. We went back to the U.S., leaving Mansour much as we had found him, bitter, isolated, determined to carry on with his hunger strike. Mansour's lawyer said she'd made no headway getting anyone at the State Department to reconsider his placement. So, on the 40th day of Mansour's hunger strike, I went to see the person who had struck the deal to send him to Serbia, Ambassador Lee Woloski, the special envoy for Guantanamo closure under President Obama. All right. Hello. Hi. Lee Woloski. Nice to meet you. Thank you for Woloski coming. was pressed for time. There were 20 detainees he was still trying to find countries for in the remaining weeks of the Obama administration. I asked him about Mansour's troubles in Serbia and his hunger strike. We spent some time with a former detainee who has been resettled in, in Serbia. He was sent there last July. He seemed like he is in a very desperate situation. And he's gotten to the point that he's gone on a hunger strike to protest that. Well, I'm, I'm not aware that he's on a hunger strike. Uh, this is... Uh, this is, this is the first I've heard that he's on a hunger strike. It's, his yeah. lawyer said that they, they'd informed uh, the U.S. government about, about the hunger strike. Well, hunger strikes are not the right way to proceed in addressing grievances. The right way to do things there is to try to make the resettlement work. We can't force people to make good life choices. Uh, we can only encourage them to do it and to create an environment where that's possible. I think we've done that here, and I think the Serbian government has also done it. Is there any additional responsibility from the U.S. government to the detainees after they've been released and, and resettled? We don't make apologies for having detained people lawfully. However, we also try to create an environment where individuals can move forward with their lives. The Serbian government has created an environment where if he decides to learn the language and take advantage of the opportunities uh, that are being offered to him, 
we are still confident that it can be a successful resettlement. But on the State Department's own website, it talks about xenophobic violence being a, being a problem in, in Serbia. We've seen no indication uh, in this case uh, that that is a factor at all. None of the resettlements that we do are easy. They require work on the part of the individual that's been um, transferred and put in a completely alien environment. I'm not minimizing that. What I am saying, though, is that sometimes life isn't perfect and you have to you know, make a decision about where you find yourself in life. Uh, I, I do have to be in a meeting to make sure that we're able to get more people out of Guantanamo. Weeks later, I'd heard that Mansour started eating again when his mother in Yemen threatened to start her own hunger strike if he didn't stop his. Then, when I was home on a Saturday afternoon, he called. This is he said he discovered hidden cameras in his apartment and started ripping them out. There's one in the corner over there. You see it? Yeah. Yeah, hold, hold up a little higher. It was here. I used my iPad to record our video call. The second one is here. The third one is there. You see it? Yeah. This is horrible. Really, it's enough. Being watched and camera on my part in my in the place where I live. I imagine probably you you know whoever has the cameras is going to probably come by at some point. I'm in deep so. A few minutes later, a group of men came in. Mansour turned the camera on them and kept talking to me. The police came here, and the government and the Secret Service, they came here, and, and as you there's a mosque people here, and there is more guns, like eight of them, inside, outside. So what, what, what is going to happen right now? I don't know. Okay. Me, can you leave my laptops, please? We'll give you an order to, to take my laptop. I didn't think this will end well. What's wrong with you? You tell me what's wrong with me. Oh, come on. At that point, I'm more men came in. So, can you tell me why I'm being watched in my apartment? Give me one reason. Am I a criminal? I don't know. Are you a criminal? No, I'm asking. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, okay. You have two choices. Yes. We take your phone now. And you're going in the hospital if you make any kind of the problems. You know the situation. Mm -hmm. Just listen to me. I'm speaking now. You don't speaking now. And no, I'm not giving you my phone. I'm just telling you. No, I'm not. Don't talk to me like this, please. You know who you are here. No, I, I don't you care. You, you take me to your country. It's not my fault. You have the choice. I'm, I don't know. And to speak. No, no. Speak with me like a man. Speak with me. I'm coming down. I have the nothing wrong. You open the door for me. I cooperate with you. Now you're throwing right at your voice against me. What do you have to? Do you like my problem? Tell me what's wrong with you. I'm not slave. I'm a slave. You're not a slave. If you want to come and me, I don't care. I'm 15 years in Guantanamo. I'm trying to do my best for will. Now you're all members against me. Don't scare me. But I'm not a man. I would, I don't, if, if I was a bad guy, I'm a stupid. Okay. I'm, I'm very smart. I'm very dangerous. But I'm not a man. 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 i but the audio kept going as the men explained why they were there. We, as a state matter, we have to see if you have any other intentions except going back to a normal life. How should I know you are not like a friend? Look, I have done nothing wrong in my life. I have nothing to be afraid of. Well, the only but, thing that I care is that nothing happens. Nothing happened and nothing will happen. I want to make my life. I want to start my life. He has to come to an Arabic country. Do you know the, that you don't probably have opportunity to do it? They see that the Trump administration now, it is not the same like before one month. I don't think <laughs> that you actually had the choice. Mansour told me they took his phone and laptop. And when he got them back, he says all of his data had been wiped clean. I called Serbian officials again for comment but they wouldn't respond. I returned to Guantanamo just before President Trump took office. There are still 41 detainees being held. 
Five of them are accused of planning the 9-11 terror attacks. Their trial is expected to take place here in the coming years. Around the base, there are signs of a long future ahead. What's going on here in terms of the construction? Currently here on the Alpha Block will be a exam, exam room for the Team Medical Center. How far away is this from, uh, from being finished? Sometime in 2017. The commander of the detention center says they're prepared. There's some construction going on here. Is that an indication that this facility will be around for, for a while? We're preparing for uh, whatever the possibility may be. Going forward with that, it provides a, us a capacity and ability to provide better medical care uh, to the detainee population. Helps us out also if there's an aging population, if we're here you know, 5, 10, 15 years down the road as well, because we have to look for all possibilities for that. If the new commander in chief, who said that he, he wants to keep the facility open and start sending new detainees here, how would you be able to, to adjust? We have you know, multiple you know, uh, you know, plans in place. The first thing we'd probably do would be looking at you know, not intermingling new detainees coming in, so we'd have to figure out the best way to, to do that based upon the number of detainees we'd get. Outside, as I took another tour of the camp, something unusual happened. A detainee yelled out to me from the rec yard. I leave, go home. I leave, go home. You leave, go home? Yeah. Where, where's home? Communication between detainees and journalists is usually forbidden. They made us stop filming. But I was able to continue talking to him off camera for several minutes. He said he was detainee number 242, that he'd had four reviews but is being held indefinitely without charges. He said he's worried he'll be here forever. Later, I texted Mansoor about the exchange. I texted him that, uh, that a, a detainee tried to talk with me. It's prisoner number 242. Mansoor says, this is my best friend. He said, I think he has hunger strike. His name is Khaled, Yemeni. Hasn't been clear yet. Monster said they want him to admit he was wrong. They are crazy. But he says, um, sorry, can't talk about this issue anymore. It brings only pain, and I haven't figured out what to do. Today, there are 26 detainees, like the one who called out to me, being held here indefinitely without charges. And there are five men who had been cleared for release like Mansoor, but didn't get out of Guantanamo before Donald Trump took office.